time uh, we will work on what a hand they speak French. So, but sorry. Yeah, when I saw the title and I read it, I read blood, sweat, tears. And I say, my God, another working group on finance. <laughs> and, and I should avoid that, for sure. So, more seriously, uh, when Florian, uh, our, our communication officer, um, informed me of this project of Flight of the Swan, uh, I was so excited that without knowing Sasha, I said, OK, I should be engaged in this project. Because it's really not only an exciting project, a useful project, but it's a fantastic project. First, because of course, Sasha engaged herself uh, on security. And perhaps she will tell us, uh, you told me you will speak no longer than two hours this time. That's it? <laughs> OK. So she will, she will tell us what she has on culture, what lesson learned, and so on. And why Iva engaged itself with many others and supporting Sasha. It's because we all know that rising awareness among people are an essential part of our work. Because here, we all talk together. In a way, we are belonging to the same family. And we have to convince others that first, these birds are fantastic creation. They can also link people, link culture. That is really important because we need all of us to work for uh, safeguarding this bird. And of course, there is also an issue. Roderick will tell us more about, I think, hunting issues, probably. So, and we need also the hunters because people in the wild, farmers, conservationists, hunters, and people are living now in the cities. So what they can see is through the TV or tablet or anything else. The, it's difficult for them now to experience nature, either because they have not been teach or taken by hand in the wetlands to see how it's wet. Uh, OK, so we are, they have to experience it through such uh, experience. And then perhaps they will be eager to say, ah, oh, fantastic bird, what I can do for them? And perhaps they even dream to have a paraglider, I don't recommend it at all, yeah, because it's a bit dangerous. Dangerous in front and behind, and even when you sit on it. But that's, I think, a fantastic experience. And I hope that it will give you ideas, innovative, uh, um, innovative uh, subject, just to, to, to make migratory bird more uh, visible on the scene. Because of course, and we're in South Africa, we all talk about elephant. There was a, a, a news in, in, on Cape Town Journal to yesterday, I think, because a young elephant was shot. But how many swan are shot? Unknown. We don't know them. We don't know the issue. So with such experiences, we can write it. And it's not only flight of the swan, it's in fact dealing with conservation of migratory, migratory birds. So I will not talk too much because uh, I spent already one day in this room dealing with other subjects, less appealing, but we have to do. And I will give the mic either to Sasha or Roderick, which is next. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So the story I'm going to tell you is uh, one of, uh, was just a tiny sample of an expedition to fly with the Buick Swans from Arctic Russia uh, to the UK. I'm going to try and give you an idea of how we were trying to get scientists and the public inside the head of migrating birds. And I'll also try along the way to share with you a little bit of the comm strategy behind it, as I'm expecting that's what some of you are interested in. Um, and also ways that I would try and turn my own journey, clearly I'm nothing physically like a Buick Swan, how I tried to turn my own story um, into a way that I could tell the story from the bird's point of view. Um, I won't be giving a huge amount of details on the outcomes of it, but we can talk about that in the Q&A afterwards. Um, before I start, I should clear up a few uh, things that I've been called throughout this trip and beforehand. One of those is a bird expert. So. 
Am I going to have to move to get around those pylons? Um, before joining WWT nine years ago, I knew basically nothing about birds. I uh, was once a marine biologist, but I've been working in strategic communications for conservation and science for about 15 years. I've also been called Baroness Sasha Dench, member of the British royal family, um, which is not true, but that happened in Lithuania, and perhaps Sally yes, can explain later how that happened. Um, but I've also been called a daredevil and a complete natural in the air, which is also very not true. I used to have a debilitating fear of flight, and I'm telling you that so that you have a little bit more sympathy for me uh, when you see a little bit of video that is coming up. So yeah, this, the focus of this project was around the Buick Swan, um, but many elements of the story are probably similar for species uh, that you deal with and flyways that you're working on. So a few years ago, I was called in to help the conservation team with uh, a problem, and this was it. Sorry, the Buick Swan was in decline over the past decade, we'd, uh, or a couple of decades. We'd lost almost half. Just briefly, we knew some of the reasons. There was illegal shooting. One in three birds has got shot in their body. Um, some of them are uh, getting sick and dying from eating lead. Um, uh, but in lots of areas, it seems the hunters weren't really believing us that this was a problem. Collisions with power lines was an issue, but where was it happening? Could, they be, could it be happening enough to be actually uh, responsible for the declines as we were seeing them? And in lots of the regions, the wetlands they once used are just not there anymore or really depleted. So this group of people had gotten together and written the action plan for the, the Buick swans for the European population. And the problem, though, was um, there had been very little action uh, since 2012. And there was a general sense that time was running out for, for the birds. So excuse the boring slide for a moment, but as a comms person, as they were talking, this was the summary of what the kind of message I was getting. First of all, the birds fly through some amazingly remote areas. What is going on up there? Is something happening in the, the northern communities? We were fairly sure hunting was happening up there, for example, but we weren't sure exactly why or how to fix it. Um, how do we engage those target audiences that we were talking about, like the farmers and the hunters and the power companies? Was there something we were missing? The birds travel a very long way. Um, it could be that we were just weren't aware of something. A big issue from all of the partners along the flyway was that they were finding decision makers just weren't interested um, or weren't interested enough um, when you're dealing with migratory birds. Obviously, there's 11 countries they're flying over and different issues in each country. Why should one country do their bit if the next one wasn't going to do their bit? So from that, I gathered that we also needed to create a big tidal wave of enthusiasm for the Buick Swan in countries um, from the Arctic to the UK. So in a normal comms plan, this is kind of what you're, what you're working to, awareness raising, eventually leading up to change. But like I said, for all of you working on migratory species, this is a lot more complicated. Uh, and the, the, the researchers I was talking to had a plan for at least engaging those specialist audiences, which has started with writing letters to all those different interest groups, now including hunters. Now, I grew up in a hunting community in Australia, and my gut reaction to that was uh, letter writing just isn't going to work or isn't going to work fast enough, mostly because the story that we were talking about telling of lots of swans dying was just one that not many people wanted to hear. So I just kept looking at the map of their migration. And like I said, I didn't really know a huge amount about birds. I had said before, the swans migrate from Arctic Russia to the UK, but I'd never contemplated exactly what that meant. So they're starting. This is a, basically a, a swan called Hope that had a GPS collar on. Um, they're starting up in the Arctic in the land of the polar bear and the reindeer breeders. They cross some of the vast wetlands of the tundra, the dense forest of the taiga, across the Baltic, uh, lands of castles and huge farmlands. And in the autumn migration, they're doing it uh, when at a time of kind of storm and fog and turbulent weather. And in many countries, obviously, they're also dodging guns. Now, to me, I heard all of that and I thought, that is like a James Bond story of the natural world. Now, whilst they didn't want to hear about dying swans, that is a story pretty much anybody would want to hear. Uh, the only challenge I had was figuring out how to tell it. 
Um, so I thought about trying to put cameras on birds and Ruth quickly uh, told me off for that. Um, we talked about trying to get cameras, uh, camera people all along the flyway recording the story uh, and eventually I realised the only way that I was going to uh, be able to tell a story is to fly with them and the only way that you could do it uh, is in a paramotor. Now I'm not stupid, I can see that that looks like a ridiculous idea. Uh, it is essentially hanging from a big handkerchief with a fan strapped to your back. Uh, but it does have some redeeming features, namely that you fly at about the same speed and altitude as birds. You can take off and land on your feet so you can go anywhere, even in the remote communities across all of the north, for example, there are no roads and no runways. But there was another benefit, uh, and that was no matter where I land, even in the UK, certainly as soon as I take my helmet off and people can see that I'm female, people's instant reaction is, oh my God, where have you come from? Isn't it dangerous? And how can I help? And I thought that is exactly what we need people to be asking about the Buick Swan. But I dismissed the idea because it was ridiculous. Uh, no one ever would support such a mad idea. But it started to keep me up at night, so one night I wrote it up as a one-pager and I sent it off to WWT researchers, and I got the response that I expected. Uh, followed by one that I wasn't expecting. Um, and so, so with that, um, the researchers, obviously we work in collaboration with lots of countries, so they sent it off to our partners in different countries. And what we were basically offering was to fly the journey, to uh, tell the story with visuals, uh, photographs and video. And as we arrive in each country, that we would guarantee to generate media coverage, because who wouldn't be interested, but we'd work with the local partner on figuring out what was the key message um, and where were the key sites to go to, who were the key influencers we wanted to reach. So, yeah, we would basically bring the story, use it to the best ability. And the Belgians, I don't know if I remember, the Belgians and the Germans had lots of questions about flying paramotors around birds, um, which were very sensible, and, uh, but eventually they all, uh, yeah, unanimously decided to back the project. So, uh, it then snowballed, so they ended up with 47 partners, um, some of whom are represented here tonight, which makes me particularly embarrassed when I see the promos that we were producing, which showed one woman flying four, four and a half thousand miles, and the reality was there were hundreds of people uh, behind it, making this one woman get all the way there. So. At this point, I had no uh, choice but to try and put the project together. But there were a few things I hadn't told the researchers. One of those was that every sensible paramotorist was telling me this was impossible, you couldn't do it. Uh, the second was I had no idea how to convince the Russians to let me fly across five of their heavily guarded border regions. Um, and the third was that I have a history of a debilitating fear of turbulence. Um, but never mind that. Um, I, uh, I carried on. The first mission that I had, I was given £3,000 to try and figure out how to uh, solve the logistics of crossing the... Can you click that for me? Yeah. Um, how to figure out how to cross the, the, the tundra where there are no roads, so I wouldn't be able to have a support crew of any kind. So I found myself up in the town of Narianma, uh, having gathered a room full of people who all knew something, had something to do with... Uh, logistics on the tundra and they were all men and I explained the project and what I wanted to do and after they stopped asking but who's the real pilot who's the actual pilot because it couldn't possibly be me um, I brought out my Google map and uh, asked them you know these these towns I can see on the north will I get fuel there and one of them put his hand up and said do you know what the words mean in brackets at the end of the town name and I hadn't looked it up and I was like no uh, and he said it means abandoned uh, so clearly I wasn't going to get fuel there. And then this very lovely man in the bottom left um, stood up and he'd brought his own map. And I don't know if you can see that there's small sort of pen markings he was writing. And he it turns out he's a bush pilot called Vlad and he takes hunters to hunting huts um, and um, visits or de delivers supplies to some of the meteorological stations up in the north and he was offering to leave me fuel drops. 
uh, which was great. Uh, the second thing he was offering is well, that he's also chairman of the reindeer breeders in that region. So he could tell me within a few days of leaving approximately where all of the reindeer breeder communities would be as they're nomadic. So if I ever needed help, he'd be able to go to them. So with that, I had a way of crossing the tundra, which was fantastic, but it was also the start of building a network of people who already were part of our interest groups. Some were from the Nanets community, some were um, dealing with hunting tourists, who were already part of this project to try and save the swans, and who are from, since the project, core to the Swan Champion Network, but which we can talk about a bit later. But it wasn't all good news from the tundra. Um, there was a group up there, a couple of paramotorists, who I'd never thought people would paramotor up there, who told me the trip isn't possible, the winds are too strong, you very rarely get um, tailwinds, it's too cold, and the air is too wet. And the worst thing was that apparently behind um, Kolgiev Island in the north, the air is so turbulent, it's a bit like the Bermuda Triangle for aircraft. Now, I don't know how many of you have been up there, but it's incredibly flat, so I couldn't really understand why the air would be so turbulent, but I had to deal with it anyway. So I knew I'd have my work cut out for me, convincing insurance companies and everybody else to let me fly, but the great thing about starting to prepare for this a year earlier was that with all the preparation, we had something that the media could start to engage with, um, get them involved really on, really early on, so that they would carry on and yeah, become sort of long-term supporters of the project. Um, the challenge for me, though, was to make sure that I was always connecting what I was doing with what the swans might have been doing, because we didn't need people at the end to care about me, though we needed them to try and um, feel empathy towards the swans. So we ended, what ended up being an online, uh, a, a, yeah, an online thing called Sasha versus the Swans, where we picked up everything that was similar and what was different. So this is the first bit of training. Um, I mentioned before my fear of turbulence, and I'll just let you watch it. So basically, up in the north, and certainly with, with climate change, the, the, the turbulence and the storms the, the Swans are going to have to deal with will, um, will only get worse. Can you turn the volume up at all? Notice there that the wing almost flew underneath me. The purpose of this exercise is to do the worst possible thing to your wing, make it collapse, and stop it from flying under you, um, because then you can end up falling into it. At the end of these exercises, I actually didn't remember what I did. I had to look back at YouTube, to, at the video, sorry, to see um, that I'd remained calm and been able to deal with it. So, yeah, it was probably terrifying, and you'll see that in my face. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing I had to deal with, which the swans also had to deal with, is um, issues of uh, bear attacks and accidents, particularly collisions. Crashing down. Let's take it. Engines off. Engines off. Oh, quick, we can stand. We've got to pour it out of there. Where is it? Mind your chest. Cut the. Cut the. First thing we've got to. It's obviously simulating with an actress. But every second. Get her in there. Stop the black. Stop the black. Stop the black. So basically that was all 
really good training for the team in working together. Um, but it was also obviously visually very interesting for the media. And all this, the footage that we were gathering, we were turning it into stories and sending it off to partners along the flyway so that they could also um, share the stories. And that was, for example, appearing in Russia. And so a Russian paratrooper saw one of the pieces and decided to write me a letter with drawings. Um, he'd been dropped in the tundra from an aircraft and he had three times and he'd almost died every time. And so he'd written me a, uh, this description of all the ways I was definitely going to die. Um, but the core of it was water landings. Um, so I then had to go and uh, prove that I could uh, handle water landings. Obviously, this is not an issue for swans. Any lessons learned in the safety of this pool could save Sasha Dench's life. She has to prepare for the worst. Sasha's been training for months, including flying in Arctic conditions, before she attempts something that's never been done before, following Buick swans on their 7,000 kilometre migratory flight from northern Russia to the UK. She'll fly a paramotor, essentially a large parachute-style canopy with a propeller on her back. The objective is to find out why their numbers are under threat, but to do that, Sasha needs to try and eliminate the risks to her life. The impact is all a bit of a shock, and the North Sea might be a bit colder than this. It's interesting to try different scenarios. So, for example, if the impact was hard, if the waves had been big, and um, we just practiced what would happen if I was, for example, paralyzed, couldn't use my legs, could I still write myself, just using movement of buoyancy. And um, yeah, that also worked quite well being very confident about the idea of being potentially paralysed. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was all, all part of it. So the next thing uh, was cold. Um, I guess swans don't have the same issues with cold because they're flapping their wings and creating a lot of heat on, in flight. This was me in a cold chamber um, simulating about minus 20 degrees, which is what I guessed I'd have um, at, a, at altitude and with, uh, with um, wind chill as well. Um, so which was actually fine with a few layers of clothing, except um, for measuring of core temperature. Has anyone had their core temperature measured before in a lab? You have to, like a bullet that you have to put up your bottom and there's a cable that comes out of it, down your leg and out the door and into this lady's computer. Um, which is obviously nothing like the swans, except maybe it's a bit like, if any of you catch birds and dig them a cloacal swab? Kind of, maybe it's a little bit like, maybe it's a little bit like that. Um, so the other issue I had, which the birds don't have, uh, was... <laughs> Those Russian permissions. Um, so yeah, they had lots of really good reasons to say to say no, and I had all the permissions I needed except the permission to fly. So one day my Russian fixer called and he said, Sasha, it's great that you've got celebrities like Sir David Attenborough and Ranulph Fiennes as patrons, but the Russians don't really know who they are. Um, but what they really love is James Bond. And I realized that your last name is Dench. Um, you all know who she is, I take it? So with a bit of research, it turns out that I am in fact related to M, um, but it's a bit spurious. My great-great-grandfather is her great-grandfather, but I'm from the second illegitimate wife, uh, Bessie from, <laughs> from Battersea. So I found myself explaining this to her and her agent and um, how her support could help save the swans, and she eventually agreed to be a patron to write us some letters of support, and I did eventually get my answer from the Russians, which went, we cannot give you permission, but with a few conditions, we won't stop you. And good luck to you and the swans. So at that, um, I was off. This was our launch up in the Arctic where um, Putin's man up in that region came down to give me a handshake and send me off on my way. And this was the amount of equipment that I had to take on me um, uh, across the tundra. The plan was that there was a cameraman going to be flying for most of the way, but the plan was that um, I had to have enough to be able to survive and look after myself for three days on the tundra. Needless to say, I ended up leaving some of that behind. Um, but I show the picture because whilst the swans have none of that to worry about, in every school that I landed at on the way, I would get out my kit and have the kids take an item at a time and figure out or uh, answer what is it how do I use it to, to survive a migration? And what does a swan do um, to, uh, yeah, to, how does a swan achieve the same thing? So it was just an alternative way of getting kids thinking about the world from a bird's eye view. 
And just to be clear, if anybody thinks there was tame swans or was hoping there'd be tame swans in this story, there aren't. WWT had, ta had put GPS collars on, uh, on birds for the past few years, and so there were birds um, with GPS collars. So my plan was to leave when the first bird left and generally follow their route and wherever possible meet up with them uh, along the way. If they did anything unusual, the researchers back at WWT would ask me to go off and figure out why they might have been going there, what might be going on. So this was up in the Arctic, absolutely beautiful, looking forward to a few days of rest, but Daisy Clark had other ideas. Um, so pretty much when the first cold northeasterly winds arrived, she was off on migration. It was, what was that? Date. The date. Uh, I think it was September 17, but <laughs> I don't remember exactly. It was two years ago. I think it was September 17. Um, so basically, it was still quite warm. It was the first cold wind, so it hadn't actually got really cold, but it was the first northeasterly winds that arrived. Um, so for the next little while, I'd like you all to imagine with me for a moment what it is like to fly across the tundra trying to get inside the head of the bird. So sit back in your seat and imagine you can feel the reassuring hum of a propeller behind you. Up above you, or your hands are at about shoulder height, holding onto the brakes, and your fabric wing is, about, is above you, about 10 meters across, with lots of fine lines that connect you to it, so you can feel every movement of the wing. Now, if you look down across your dangling feet, the beautiful swirling colors of the treeless Arctic tundra. Now, swan families look up at you, and you can see there's still plenty of water plants at this time of year, and you make a note of that. There's occasional bubbles in some of the pools, signs that the Arctic is thawing and changing fast, and you can note that too. Uh, and then you remember the pilot's advice on, a, on emergency landings in the Arctic, which was white, uh, green, no, white, yes. And as you can see from this picture, there were times when I would have, really would have liked a little bit more instruction. <laughs> and then you're straight back to scanning the horizon for wolves and bears and anything else that might want to eat a swan or you. If you get a bit nervous, cross your ankles. It does absolutely nothing, but it's somehow reassuring. If you get really nervous, practice reaching your reserve parachute. It's somewhere down by your right bum cheek. And then across to the right, about 100 meters away, you see a big flock of swans. But hang on, there's swans and geese flying together. Maybe that's one of the reasons the birds are being shot. Are they being mistaken for geese? And then you notice that two of the birds from the flock have broken away from the group and they're getting closer to you and closer and closer. And just as you're about to pull a really sharp left-hand turn to avoid them colliding with your lines, they tuck in behind your right wingtip and for, as though you're the lead bird. And just for a few magical moments, you really do feel like the human swan. So on I flew across the north coast, where the bird's main aim was to get to the next wetland site as possible. Mine was to talk to people. But would the locals be sympathetic to me or shoot at me as everybody had predicted? What would the reindeer breeders think of this huge blonde flying woman, and I am huge compared to the, them, um, landing beside their chum amongst the reindeer? Now, just to help paint a picture for you of what I must have looked like to them, after a couple of hours flying in the Arctic, I am normally blue, cold, shivering, with bad helmet hair, and I probably have tears and snot dried in streaks down my cheeks where I've been too busy flying to try and wipe them away. Now, uh, now I know, when you land in that sort of state, uh, in the Arctic, in fact, anywhere along the flyway, people's instant reaction isn't to see you as a threat. They grab a hold of you, drag you inside, wrap you in reindeer skins, offer you a cup of hot, cranberry juice, maybe a slab of raw, rotten reindeer meat, and if you're lucky, a bright pink, salty, metallic reindeer blood pancake. And then eventually, they ask me, so you really did fly here in that thing just to talk to us about swans? And eventually, through basic human curiosity, they want to know more. Now, just to give you a little bit of background here, we had already done an anonymous survey of communities up in the north, so we already knew that there was a lot of reporting of um, shooting um, up in the north. So my, my role there with people, though, was hoping that they would open up and give us a bit of an idea of why that might be and if there were ways that we could stop it. So this whole journey across the north was physically and mentally really exhausting for me, but every time somebody cried because I had flown all the way there to speak to them in person, or hunters waved me off saying, don't worry, we'll look after swans and they don't taste very good anyway. Um, 
or, uh, or little girls looked up at me and went, wow, can girls fly? Uh, it gave me the strength to put my survival kit on and uh, fly on. And on I flew. Um, uh, on this particular occasion, the team at HQ said, um, the Swan called Leo has gone north um, to this delta, and we didn't think this was a, a common site um, used by the birds on autumn migration where you go up and have a look. But unfortunately, there's a Russian submarine base near, nearby and an airport, so there was no way they were going to give me permissions. But a local pilot said to me, oh, it's okay, I know air traffic control, they'll let me fly, I'll take you. So five minutes, we get in the plane, and five minutes into the flight, he looks at me and he goes, ah oh, we're crazy. Uh, and then I realized he hadn't asked for permission, he was going to ask for forgiveness later. Um, <laughs> but he did take me on a triangle around this site, uh, which... Uh, yeah, so I've counted about 2,000 swans um, in different small groups in that area. So I could pass that on to HQ and carry on. And on across the thick tiger forest, a land of uh, lots of trees and not very many landing sites, where the fog at this time of year just seems to appear and disappear and occasionally sandwiches you between it and the tops of the trees, forcing a difficult decision. Land in the trees, you'll probably survive, but it'll be a bit messy. Uh, or go up into the dreaded white room. So I would choose up and hope that it would only be a few hundred feet thick. And two and a half thousand feet later, you emerge into a white world where it's so cold there are icicles forming on lines. And I scan the horizon for kind of reassuring sights of small groups of birds that were forced to make the same decision. And... In, across the tiger, I was landing, uh, still trying to land with any community that I found. Obviously, kids loved it. I'd circle around a village, and there'd be kids running from miles around trying to say hello. In fact, I had to, because there was only, the only real clearings you could land were roads in the village. So I had to develop a method of finding a place to land, going somewhere else and circling there until I attracted all the children to that spot, and then came in and landed elsewhere. Um, so yeah, the trip was going fine. Uh, until the media, well, I thought it was going fine, but the media crew sat me down and they said, Sasha, you know how you're always so positive? Well, this trip is really long and it's going to get really boring unless we have a bit more jeopardy. Can you be a bit, like, angry or scared or something on camera? And lucky for them, the following day, I snapped the ligaments in my right knee trying to take off and they got on camera the screaming, teary drama they had been hoping for. Uh, and then despite lots of medical tape and determination, it became obvious that I wasn't going to be able to fly again from my feet. So this man on the right, uh, the engineer on the trip, with the help of locals, decided to tie my paramotor with string to a set of wheels and see if I could learn to fly like that. really sucked at it. I didn't have the arm strength um, and there was a few things they'd forgot to do to the trike but basically um, yeah I sucked and the whole thing was filmed and broadcast to the world but the media team were right. The general media absolutely loved it. It gave us a whole new wave of support uh, unfortunately and interest and then when later on we lost the swan called Charlotte um, we'll never know exactly why she died but the important thing is that this time lots of people cared and they wanted to know. They wanted to know news um, about you know what was what was going wrong for her, um, and they cared enough that lots of people were watching online, not just the Russian authorities, um, and they cared enough to come down and visit the camp when they could, to um, send us in photographs of co uh, collared birds when they arrived in their town, which was great. Um, but they also started sending us information online, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So this is an example of some swan collisions with power lines. I think, I believe at this site, because of uh, general interest, there are now big diverters on these power lines. I'll spare you of that. Um, but also uh, evidence of um, illegal hunting in different places. So the great thing is, you know, with this, we can actually do something about it. So on I flew, beware from here, it's going to get really quick, we're going to miss out a lot of countries, but this was crossing Poland, some of the remnants of the, the vast wetlands that once were, this is Biebsza, uh, where I flew over a big herd of elk that looked up at me and must have wondered what on earth, and then a quick detour across this uh, quite terrifying wet forest, but I did it because our Polish partners got me, called me on the phone in flight and said, do you think you could make a detour and land at 10 past nine in this field, live on, on 
Polish breakfast television. Um, because if you can, we can talk about lead poisoning um, to a mass audience, and this doesn't happen. And I don't know if you remember from the side event that Poland uh, is one of only two of the major countries in Europe that still allow shooting with lead over wetlands. So I did it. Um, I landed live on television. I talked about lead poisoning, and chaos broke out. We had hundreds of public calling the hunting communities, a hunting federation, um, asking for answers and change. We had hunters uh, emailing the TV company and the hunting federation um, demanding that they be allowed also on live breakfast television to give their point of view. And the main TV company looking at me to say, can you sort out this mess? And I just said, like, why don't you invite them all to dinner? Um, and so we did, and they came. Um, and I have to say, it was, uh, I, it was a, a great meeting. I mean, it started as you would expect. I talked about the reasons against using lead. They gave me the reasons for lead, um, and that includes the main Polish TV, uh, hunting TV show as well in that group. And as we were talking, though, it became obvious that some of them hadn't understood the really basic mechanism of lead poisoning, that it was the lead that the birds actually eat which is causing the poisoning. So I then described what an autopsy was like, and some of them came to the, um, so what a, what a bird who has, a lead poisoned bird who's died is like, what the autopsy is like, um, to make it really clear. And the next day, some of them came to our SWAN conference, and there has been various sort of attempts from then, so we've tried to get going some um, alternative shot demo demos uh, in Poland. The, the idea of banning lead has actually been to the Senate. It didn't go through, but there are at least tiny steps. But the nice thing for me was these two who are spokespeople for the Polish hunting community said, we can kind of see that lead, is, um, lead has got to go, but the amazing thing for them was that they'd never sat down and actually spoken to a conservation organization face to face before. So anyway, tiny steps, but maybe in the right direction or the right direction from our point of view. So now we've jumped to crossing the channel. So eventually I made it back to the UK um, to, I don't know how many of you know the channel, but it's about 30 miles, 30 kilometers. So I landed the other side back in the UK to the media asking, so how does it feel to be the first woman to cross the English Channel in a paramotor? And I wanted to say, well, I've just flown six and a half thousand kilometers. You don't care about that? Or, uh, or a, man, a man crossed this channel in the 80s, so it's about bloody time. Um, but I think I managed something vaguely more inspirational because the media had been incredible allies for this whole trip. We had generated 1,700 stories by that time. 1,000 of those were TV. Uh, sorry, TV and radio, and 84 of those had been in Russia and lots of them national television programs. That's in a country where everybody had said to us, the Russians won't be interested in conservation. So the media had been fantastic. They'd helped us reach millions of people. Um, some of those people had already done something to help, um, to make a difference. Some of those had just turned up to uh, cheer, uh, cheer me up and cheer us on in their own crazy ways. But what was very clear from this was that by bringing to life the story of the swans, um, we had open doors that we thought were closed, started conversations um, that weren't happening beforehand, and change is happening. And we can talk about that a little bit later because I think I'm at time. Um, these are some of the successes, but again, we can go through that a bit later. You can bring me up on that, Ruth. Um, and a lasting legacies for those countries that want to be involved sorry, that were involved in the project, um, which includes the film. So a film has taken a long time. I think there were 600 hours of film recorded on this, so it's taken a while to get a film to completion. Um, but with the, the next round of communications, we'll be showings of the film in different countries. And does anybody want to see a trailer? I'm hoping you say yes. <laughs> okay.
being shot. It could be the end of that, that nest. Okay, this is going to be hard to... Uh, <laughs> I think we can only say that this is, this is wonderful. Uh, completely agree with uh, Jacques' introduction. Uh, this really is inspiring, uh, and I think that is uh, one of the best achievements that you can have with this, uh, with this project. I was asked to just share a little bit on, on because FACE has been involved on a tiny bit of it, uh, but to explain why we, uh, why we were involved. Um, so we don't really engage with, uh, just to start with that, we don't really engage with the Russian hunters. Um, but the problems that you've seen along the whole flyway, I think, uh, don't only count for this species or from the countries. I think they're more broad than that, and that's probably one of the reasons why we were involved uh, back then. Um, one of the things that it does, uh, it brings the issues that are far away, the, the tundra, the taigas, uh, really close to home. We've seen this now, you can really feel it almost. Um, it creates awareness about conservation, about a species that nobody really knows a lot about. Uh, it's innovative. Um, I don't know if anybody else has done some, something even similar than this. Um, at least I don't know about it. Um, and for us, it highlights a couple of very important topics that we as an organization also need to engage with, uh, which is illegal killing, it's misidentification of species, as you said, about the mixing of, uh, of the flights, about uh, the use of ammunition. Um, so those are things that are not only for this species or these countries, but all around Europe. And I think even if, as we've seen this week, uh, also in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, and it also creates understanding, and that was also one of the beautiful things that I think uh, come out of this, this, this video, is that you really can engage with people, even far away, even people that are hunters, although you don't you're a hunter yourself, or other people. And I think that is also very important to, uh, to show to everybody around the world. Um, and just to say that to everybody here, FACE is an organization that doesn't really do work on the ground. We have a network of 36 uh, members all around Europe that can actually do these things. And it's uh, through these kind of communication projects that we can also create awareness uh, among them. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to see what your next destination is going to be. And with that, uh, we might uh, go to the Q&A. <coughs> so, now you have the floor, or the sky, I don't know. Uh, so please, feel free to ask any question, either to people who need probably to go for psychiatry. Uh, there is an ambulance on the parking, Sasha, so you can go back to your hotel in a nice way. So, feel free to exchange what you are feeling, if you have experience, and so on. So. We will not let you get out without some questions. Yes. So please, be creative yourself. Solius. Thanks. I need explanation to Sasha. She asked me uh, how she became Baroness in Lithuania. Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, 
Baron Dench is uh, true legend in Lithuania. He was one of knights of King English Henry IV, who tried unsuccessfully to capture Vilnius in 1390. But he became legend because he was the only one of Englishmen who managed to drink very strong honey meat more than our king. <laughs> and we still remember him after 700 years. So when we asked our president uh, to be patron of this uh, nice event, her answer was that she normally meets with no less the, than with somebody like William and Kate. But <laughs> when I said that uh, she is probably the ancestor of uh, uh, Baron Dench, <laughs> our president immediately made press release and all our TVs <laughs> informed that uh, Sasha is Baroness Dench and our <laughs> president is patron of this thing. So. <laughs> Thanks, Julius, for this uh, uh, story. Oh. Anybody else has a, a story, a question? Yes. Can, can I, I, I can use yeah, this yeah, microphone. That's right, yeah, yeah thanks. Yes. Um, yes, also, huge uh, congratulations for this excellent mission. Um, yeah, a comment as well, Roderick uh, touched on it. The issue of lead shot over wetlands will, will soon be dealt with for, for Poland and the other couple of countries through um, an EU-wide restriction. And our position uh, in, in, in terms of the European Hunting Federation is lead shot needs to go over, over wetlands. So it's good to see uh, the, the final progress there. Uh, a question on the, the, the hunting issue in Russia. So. Did you manage to piece together whether uh, it was locals that can hunt another species of swan from a subsistence perspective or from a recreational perspective? Or you also mentioned tourist hunters, whether there's any issue there. Uh, in, in terms of trying to understand how, how Buick swans are being um, shot along the way, and I'm assuming most of the, the shooting um, whether it's legal or illegal in Russia, um, because it would be illegal when it comes further, you know, down the flyway. Thank you. Is that working? Uh, so it was a little bit of a confused situation, I'd say. There was definitely, so there was a mixture of people. There's some, so there's definitely hunting for, by the Nanets. Some people had said uh, they didn't realize the swans were protected, and now we've seen it is kind of confusing because the Russians have their own red list. They also have a hunting list. There are different <coughs> swans, different white swans on the different lists, and most people couldn't tell. I think only 13% of people could identify a Buick swan compared to another swan. So I uh, definitely, so on one occasion, at one of the meteorological stations, I landed and there were two swan carcasses by the front door, um, but he, inside he had this beautiful poster of all the different swan species. So it's, it's nothing to do with disrespecting swans. Um, so there was that bit of confusion. Um, misidentification of swans was an issue. So in, when I got to Arkhangelsk, we spoke about that with the hunting authority there. And a year and a half later, when I went back, we went back for a swan champion meeting. We had created a swan ID guide with little audio clips and everything, because he had promised that he would send out information with the hunting licenses, there were 50,000 of them. And so we brought this document for him to maybe use, and he said, oh, I did it last year. Uh, which was fantastic to hear that he'd kind of acknowledged that was a, an issue. Um, and tourist hunting is, is definitely an issue. So there were a couple of reports. I don't know if it was also in the surveys of particularly Italians wanting to go and shoot 100 white birds. Now, because it was repeated, I wonder if it's a bit of a legend, if it's real or not. Um, and I, I don't know why you would specifically want to go and shoot 100 white birds. but. Clearly, tourist hunting is an issue. There are wealthy people who will go up in a helicopter and, and hunt, and possibly they also are not told what species you can and can't hunt. So with the Swan Champions, um, which is being led by quite a lot of those people from the north, um, we are producing a, an ID guide to go in every hunting hut, and ideally there's projects to develop an app as well. So definitely lack of awareness that it was an issue um, lack of awareness of the different species uh, is an issue, and 
uh, for some of them, lack of care, but I think if the locals kind of care enough, then we'll be able to tackle that as well. That's what my hope is anyway. Do you want to add anything to that, Ruth? No? Oh, thanks. Thanks, David. Any, any, <coughs> any other question? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, congratulations, first of all. It's a really nice project, and it looks like a really beautiful film. Um, I was just wondering whether you thought of uh, the children along the route uh, being in touch with each other. Because it might be a really nice thing to create a network along the entire flyway of the swans of kids growing up to uh, take care of the swans as they grow older. Thank you. We, we did it in kind of a small way. We did have a letter writing sort of a letter writing thing that went between the different places and um, kids in different regions did create kind of swans with messages, uh, messages for the swans. But I think we kind of met with 54 schools, which is a tiny number of the people um, all along the way. There is a plan now, it's not currently funded, to create a digital version of uh, the whole flyway. We have so many amazing assets to show what that migration is like. We just have to figure out exactly the best way to do it and make sure that it's used by all the people in different countries and different languages. Um, so yes, I think also it would be a really, really nice idea. Um, but we're juggling a million other things, and lead at the moment has been <laughs> lead, lead and illegal shooting has been a bit of a priority. Um, but yeah, great idea. In fact, if you know of any other examples of where that has worked really well um, and has ongoing effect, I'd be interested in hearing. Thank you, Jasper. Then uh, David. <coughs> well, if you're asking for a good example, I think um, we have that uh, sort of strategy that 36% of all the pink Portuguese originally back in the 90s said were carrying uh, pellets after, after shotgun shooting. And due to a really targeted campaign by the Danish hunters and the Danish agency, um, this was reduced. So we came from a situation by, by which for each bird that was shot, one was injured, right? Yeah. Carried pe pellets. Now we're in a situation for, for each bird that is uh, for, for eight birds that are shot and killed, only one is, is, is wounded. So uh, an enormous um, improvement due to this very active campaign that was sort of ro uh, rolled out all the way out to the local hunters, local hunting communities, and was sort of also built into the Danish um, hunting training and the re regulations, how to shoot geese. So there, there is a way forward if you really get out and of course it was a stick in the carrot because they were also forced to do that because uh, our minister at the time, time said if you don't improve in the next five years we're going to stop all goose shooting in Denmark. So yeah, that, That's really a, a nice example and you should remind that Denmark has the highest number of waterbird hunters considering the total population of Denmark. So it, it means it's really relevant. It's not only for five people or a club. It's for the whole country. So yeah, there is a lot of lesson to learn also yeah, for this uh, training program. And uh, OK, thank Jesper for, for your, your, testimony, your, your story. David, you want to take the floor? Fantastic story. Uh, to, to, to what extent do you think the basic sort of concept um, is replicable for other flyways and other other species, or do you think it's basically it was a fairly unique situation? Sorry. Uh, I think it is very replicable in other flyways. In fact, I would love to do others. It was the best thing I ever did um, for a combination of meeting people face to face being able to share that story and being able to apply it to lots of different issues. I hope to kind of have brought that up, that you're basically bringing to life the journey of the birds and you can use that story to lead into anything and you can open doors with all sorts of people. Um, you know, even the, the hunters came, I'm pretty much sure that part of the reasons for them coming to dinner was wanting to hear what the story was like. Um, so yeah, I think it's applicable in, a, in 
other areas. There are areas which are more challenging to, to fly in. Um, but uh, one question on the madness of flying a paramotor now. I, I'm actually quite risk averse. I do do other kind of extreme sports, but I'm a real, um, I kind of, yeah, I'm, I like to try and tackle risk as opposed to being up to adrenaline. I don't jump out of airplanes. I would never bungee jump. Um, the nice thing for me about paramotoring is that people assume it's a lot more dangerous than it actually is. I know it looks, it looks horrendous, but you have always got a spare aircraft in your pocket. Now, what other aircraft let you, uh, do you have that with? Um, but that's one of the joys of it, is that you land looking so fragile, a people's instant reaction is to kind of be open, not, not closed. Okay, thanks. I think we should think about the white, white wing left tail, yeah. <laughs>